In this session, we will be discussing um, sustainability, the term that we keep uttering since the very first session, it's this way or another, but this session is entirely dedicated to sustainability. We have uh, Dilek Bill, uh, founder of Purpose Sustainable Ideas. Last time, you remember you were online, now you're back in the studio and welcome. It's very nice to see uh, known faces and I'm sure that you will take my burden. Hopefully, I can do it quite well. Now, I have no concern I'm, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, we have quite uh, experienced speakers, Laura Balmond, Ellen from the Ellen Mackack Arthur Foundation, and also we will have Murat Gursoy from the McKinsey Company, and we'll be speaking about uh, what is there to come for the fashion industry, and Laura Balmond will be speaking about circularity in fashion for a sustainable world. And I'm sure that you also have a lot to say, so without further ado, I'd like to leave the floor to you, and it's my turn to leave now. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, distinguished participants. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session. It's an honor for me to be with you this year as well. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that uh, the Paris Climate Convention was presented to our parliament, showing Turkey's decisiveness about it and strengthening Turkey's role in international trade. Uh, uh, some binding decisions have been taken and it's really important that these sanctions have been imposed in Turkey. As you know, the European Union adopted the Green Deal and started to fulfill its requirement. A climate neutral continent, Fit for 55, is the new package of recommendations of the European Union. Uh, this wind of change that is being experienced in Europe uh, has made it a necessity not only for Turkey but also for the rest of the world to take a second look into our legislation and practices. Us uh, trying to be a part of global economy and continuing to, co uh, to collaborate with developed countries requires Green Deal to be a, a priority. Concrete actions to be taken will shape up the future of Turkey. Circular economy is one of the elements of the Green Deal. You know that circular economy is conditioned as a requirement amongst some of the developed countries in our exports. Uh, it's 50% of a share that the EU countries are holding. Therefore, circular economy and compliance with this economy requires us to put it into the top uh, priorities of our agenda in the short run. Unless we take the necessary actions, it would be impossible for us to preserve our existing position in the global economy. Now, in this session, we will be discussing uh, sustainability with one of the leaders of uh, an important uh, establishment in the world and if I may I will there continue. There is no denying that fashion and textiles industry has been a major contributor to climate change which means the industry's sustainability efforts are critical to our, our planet's hurt, health. We are part of the problem and now we will talk about how to be part of the solution. Here at this panel I have Laura Baldwin with me. She is the lead of Make Fashion Circular Group at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a very important NGO that focuses on circular economy, which gives us the power to grow prosperity, jobs, and resilience while cutting greenhouse emissions, waste, and pollution. Laura, thank you for being with us. I personally appreciate your time in a very busy schedule. Laura. Thank you for having me. What will it take to transfer our, transform our throwaway fashion and textile industry into one where waste is eliminated, resources are circulated, and nature is re regenerated? Can you give us a quick overview of the principles of the circular economy and what it makes fashion circular? Absolutely. And thank you for setting the scene um, so wonderfully there. Absolutely. In a, in a circular economy, what we really talk about is waste and pollution are eliminated, products and materials are circulated, and re we regenerate nature as, as a course of doing this. Particularly for fashion, what we've been looking at is 
it's really really crucial to reach that vision and set our sights on overall how we can create a thriving future. So for fashion, we want to see clothes that are used more. They are made to be made again from safe, recycled and renewable inputs. So what that means is, you know, when we say re they are used more, this means we step away from the linear model of just selling more and more products to things such as rental, resale. Um, we design products in the first place to be disassembled, taken apart, and actually their materials captured after they can no longer be used and, and recycled. And uh, ensuring that the materials that they are made of from the outset come from non-toxic sources and renewable sources that are created in a regenerative way. That's true. Thank you. And when we say circular economy, circularity in fashion, vision, this is a vision for the future. What do we need to do to start a collaborative ac action among the investors, policymakers, brands, universities, NGOs? What would be our roadmap? One of the, the biggest things that we found is that vision, when we talk about what the future of fashion should look like, really in practice that means customers should be able to walk into any shop or interact with their favorite brand and all choices should be a good choice. And so this is something that is going to take unprecedented levels of collaboration through anyone that is involved in fashion. We have found that with the companies that we work with in, in Make Fashion Circular, it's been really important to break down that vision into something where we can actually start to envisage that future world today. And an example of this and, and finding a starting point was our jeans redesign project that we started in, in 2019. In this project, we really took down what does it mean to meet that vision and how can we already start to take steps to do that today? We picked an iconic product, a pair of jeans that most people wear or that many brands and manufacturers have in their product portfolio. And we said, how do we apply the circular economy principles to that? What does it mean for a pair of jeans to be used longer, to be made in a way it can be disassembled and recycled? and to be made from safe inputs from the beginning. And that starting point allowed us to really create a set of very clear and specific guidelines. They're open source. Anybody can get hold of them and use them. Um, and it really detailed out how a pair of jeans could meet the circular economy principles today using technologies that already exist, um, not things that we're sort of hoping for in the future. And so, we asked a group of brands and manufacturers and fabric mills as well, actually, to produce both fabric and uh, garments in line with these guidelines. So actually this year already, um, those companies have already put half a million pairs of jeans on the market that meet these guidelines. And really, these sorts of projects whereby we can get really specific about how a circular economy looks are helping people to get started, to learn with their suppliers and, and take action towards actually, um, you know, seeing what it means in practice to, to achieve a circular economy. There is obviously a shift taking place among younger consumers. What is happening from your point of view, this is one, I want to, uh, one question I want to ask. And I also would like to ask you, where, uh, where do you put innovation in this perspective? It's a really interesting question. I think, you know, to, you know most of the time what we are told uh, and marketing tells us is to buy more and look for cheaper and cheaper clothes and bargains and, and, and continue to buy more. What what has recently been happening is customers are questioning this uh, way of enjoying fashion and they are understanding there is a disconnect between you know, the effects that we are seeing on our climate, the amount of waste and pollution that is being created and how they want to feel when they wear clothes and enjoy clothes. So we've seen a real uptake in, in what we're calling new business models, things that offer uh, the same materials to be used over and over again and actually create more revenue whilst using less resources, things like rental or, or resale platforms. We've seen in the UK a huge increase in um, the platforms Depop, Vinted, Vestiaire Collective that help 
peer-to-peer -peer sharing of clothes. Um, and actually an added benefit of that has been, as well as creating that value by circulating those, those items, during the pandemic, when traditional supply chains had a bit of a challenge, the, uh, the supply chain for these ones continued because it was much more local. Um, so in terms of innovation, I think there's huge opportunity for innovation purely on the model that delivers fashion. And I think some of the most interesting things we've had have actually questioned what the customer needs. So for example, um, if many items are being used purely just to be showcased on social media and on one occasion, actually there's been companies questioning if you need to create an item of clothing in the first place. So um, Carlings and The Fabricant both make digital fashion that doesn't even exist, but it still meets that customer need. So huge opportunity within the business model itself. And then, of course, within the materials um, and within the recycling systems that we have to be able to continue to use those materials over and over again, there's a lot of scope for different and new types of materials because the materials that are in the system right now, we've also been using the same ones for, for many, many years. Laura, do you think we'll be able to redesign fashion's future? Absolutely. And I think the exciting thing is we are seeing organisations that are already starting to do that, um, taking it right back to the very question about how do I make an item of clothing? How will that item of clothing be enjoyed? But, but mostly, how do I get more value from that and prevent the materials from going to landfill or to incineration? And just a couple of examples. I mean, one of them is Napa Piri, who made a jacket where they just interrogated everything in that jacket's construction. And they actually worked out that if they made everything from the zippers to the threads to the, the filling of their jackets, they, they made a 100% recyclable jacket that when it's no longer used, it can be um, put back in. So absolutely, we're seeing lots of really wonderful examples and uh, we, we can de redesign fashion's future. Yes, in fashion and textiles, like in many other industries, attaining sustainability has become an imperative, in part because investor expectations are increasing and consumers are starting to expect sustainable products. In addition, environmental regulations are becoming stricter, industry talent is moving to sustainable companies and significant value from attaining sustainability is at stake. So thank you, Laura. Thank you for being with us and hope to see you in the future. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Distinguished um, guests this time uh, will be with Murat Gursoy, partner of McKinsey and Company. Hello. So, in the fashion and textile industries under the focus of McKinsey and Company, and uh, a survey over 2,000 uh, game respondents about fashion and textile, there is an increasing sensitivity towards, of course, the consumers. And your survey showed that also the companies should consider, especially online use. And there is also a trend of less consumption. And some circular uh, models are being used. So it is also at the core of the consumers uh, to be much more environment friendly. The pandemic's also uh, refocused on this uh, sensitivity. Uh, as you all know, companies are at the same time taking actions the, with regards to climate change. So it's only possible that they underline the sustainability commitment. So at extent circular uh, models are being developed by the company. So from this perspective, for innovation, and in this journey of sustainability, you, what would you like to say uh, or what are your recommendations for the textile and um, also the apparel industry? But I think your question is mainly for Turkey, right? I mean, the textile and in particular uh, the apparel industry for Turkey, I suppose. A great, uh, actually, a summary of uh, our survey that you mentioned, but maybe what I have to underline in here is that I think uh, we performed the study after COVID, and then we asked, I mean, we repeated the survey after the COVID-19 pandemic, maybe as an additional point for what you have mentioned so far. Of course, all these trends that we underlined in our survey, majority of those were 
also the case before COVID. I mean, sustainability, uh, for example, became a major um, preference uh, by uh, the customers, especially in uh, high income markets. Then online e-commerce, as you all know, uh, increased a lot also before the pandemics. Um, the, uh, for example, ratio of e-trade uh, reached up to 35 to 30 percent of the overall sales of the company. So, therefore, during the COVID pandemics, it actually a bit accelerated. So, uh, as for its impact on the Turkish industry, uh, for the last 20 years, I've been working with this in, in this industry and uh, implementing several projects with them. In the textile and uh, apparel industry, our Turkish industry is the most resilient one. A lot has happened. You know, international agreements and the lifting of quotas about the tariff system, several different regulations, a lot. I mean, it started 20 years ago. All the challenges, all the suffering that they've been uh, through uh, for this industry, but managed to survive somehow. For future projections, I it would say there are some good news and bad news for the future. And uh, the bad news, let's start with the bad news. Why? Because I think uh, we actually should better understand what is coming, especially in the textile and apparel industry. You know, we focus on export, which is very critical for Turkey in terms of creating employment, in terms of its contribution to our current account balance. And our main market is EU, so to a high income level market that we sell. Therefore, lifting after lifting of quotas, the main thing that helps us to hold on is actually the, the trend. So, qualified, well-trained, uh, again, workmanship and also developing our design skills thanks to logistics, uh, fast delivery uh, to the market. So, we managed to survive in the market. And we continue with our competitive edge. But now, as Laura uh, very well said, uh, fast fashion, we don't know about what's going to happen in the future for the fast fashion. Why? Because um, the consumers are starting to show their preference. Fast fashion products, if you're asking me, uh, will not be so popular in the future. So. Once this is the case, uh, we found out that the product is actually not sustainable. So, as we know by survey, um, people are checking about the greenhouse gas emission of the industry, which is just actually 1.4 billion US dollar, uh, billion ton uh, of uh, in emission. Are, greenhouse emission at the global level. I think the problem that we have in here is that all these greenhouse emission, looking at how we can reduce it, I think the share of the apparel industry is not that much huge because for the fashion industry, if there is actually, uh, again, 2.4 billion tons of uh, greenhouse emission, maybe we are saying, but it starts with agriculture from cotton and the majority of those during textile production. But uh, in particular, it's very few, again, at the apparel side, but then comes logistics retail, the other share, I would say. What I mean is that the apparel uh, industry itself is not that much creating uh, greenhouse uh, gas. But uh, whether it will be affected or not, yes, will be affected of this. The bad news is that the, it looks like if we you build your strategy on apparel only, which is just confined to uh, just a certain portion of the value chain, it uh, means that you don't have too much to offer as a solution. For example, if one of the members of the Turkish Clothing Manufacturers Association came to me, what we should do, Murat, then there are a couple of things that I can list down for them. But uh, in terms of a valuable contribution to sustainability, uh, it will not be something that I tell them as a game changer. I think 
as we are also trying it in the report, you have to consider the entire value chain. I mean, from cotton to retail shop. I mean, each and every part of the value chain, the greenhouse emission, what extent, how we can reduce it, and so on. From this perspective, Turkey is very advantageous. Why? Because in the world, looking at the entire value chain, I think we're just, Turkey is one of the few countries. There's China, maybe Egypt somehow. Turkey from cotton to apparel. That's the, what I'm trying to understand is that you're saying Turkey, uh, it is a big advantage because we have an integrated textile industry. So therefore, it's an advantage. I mean, uh, if we make a proper planning and if we focus our strategy accordingly, so it will be a big advantage to us as much as I understand. I wanted to thank you a lot for your uh, contribution because we are asked to finish the session, but we'll continue to talk to you. Thank you very much for your attention and for being with us. So, as you see, um, we have a lot that we can do for this industry, especially you have to consider your advantages on the value chain and uh, adjust your strategy accordingly. And uh, for a better uh, use of time, I would like to say have a nice